Uh, thank you very much. In the morning, we were thinking about uh, 50 years into the future, or whether it is 30 years of future. We heard from uh, the world's visionary during the morning part of the program. This afternoon, we are looking at uh, the ongoing energy transformation expansion of uh, renewables. Uh, we are starting to talk about uh, our movement towards uh, decarbonization. Two incumbent ministers have told us how uh, Japan is going to move forward. By tomorrow, since uh, the Tepco uh, Fukushima Daiichi incident, uh, 10 years uh, will have passed. Our managing director, Ono, and our chairman, uh, Mr. Son, both of them mentioned at the outset uh, that from the incident of Fukushima, what we have learned, what can we do? That has always been our question as we try to implement our energy policies at our institute uh, website. We do have some columns. Looking back at the last decade is the terminology that I used, but it should not be the 10 years that we look back at. Always from Fukushima, for 10 years, we have always been living with the nuclear accident. In that sense, this year for the first time, this revision is the 10th time, but for the first time, we have prepared a session dedicated to nuclear energy, looking at Japan and the global nuclear policies, how to phase out going forward is the topic of the upcoming session. We have to talk about phasing out nuclear, otherwise we cannot move forward with energy transformation. I have a few slides as we start the next session. In the morning and also in the afternoon, I think we have been talking about this already, across the world, Renewable is expanding explosively. According to the latest IEA data, as of last year already, PV solar has reached 710 gigawatt and 700 gigawatt is the wind, or the wind is less than 700 and the PV on the left is larger than the wind on the right hand side already. Next slide. Uh, this is uh, Japanese data, PV and the wind expansion. In the last decade, in the case of Japan, from 5 giga, the PV has gone to 70 gigawatt. The wind on the right in the last uh, 10 years from 2.6 up to 4.4 gigawatt. Lots of potential. This is only onshore, uh, but going forward, offshore will be added on. We have another almost another source of renewable. So this is also expected to expand. So with this background, as DG Francesco La Camera has told us, by now renewable is the cheapest source of power across the world. At the same time, coal or nuclear or other traditional energy, in terms of cost, they are no longer compatible competitive. They are expensive across the world. This global trend, how to transplant this trend into Japan is important. At our institute, by yesterday, we just issued the new scenario, a new report. There will be more information about this latest report after myself, but in order to realize our goal of 2050, uh, there must be more effort about our 2030 goal. Renewable, first of all, must be expanded by 2030. There's only 10 years or so. And at 2050, there's only 30 years until 2050. By 2030, uh, we must reach a stage where we can go 100% by 2050. Unless we are prepared by 2030, we should not be able uh, to real be realized a society which is based on renewable by 2030, uh, the nuclear energy should be phased out. Nuclear energy must be ended within our generation. So session two, pathway to phasing out nuclear. The first speaker, Michael Schneider, international analyst on energy and nuclear policy, Michael Schneider Consulting. 
have we been working together for 30 years already, Michael? I have enjoyed working with him across the world. Looking at the overall nuclear policy, I am sure that he is one of the most knowledgeable. Michael will tell us about the global trend of nuclear. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Mika, for that introduction. And thanks for having me here in this uh, outstanding uh, <clears throat> event. Uh, I'm very happy to be able to, to contribute uh, uh, to that. So let me jump right into uh, uh, my presentation, which um, is based on the World Nuclear Industry Status Report, um, which uh, is now in its 15th uh, edition and uh, which has developed over the years into a reference uh, publication now uh, um, 360 pages long. So it's a, it's a very major piece of work and it's it's going to be a challenge to sum it up in 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 a few minutes but I'll I'll do my best so it's a multi uh, <clears throat> indicator analysis and the first one we're looking at uh, is the uh, startup and closures in the world and uh, we have tried to uh, look at the particular role that that China has been playing over the past few years and it it really uh, you you really see how uh, China has been dominating startups uh, in over the past uh, 15 years. If you take uh, China out of that picture, you see that it's been actually a very flat development for a long time. This is, has not started with uh, 3.11. <clears throat> Obviously, the closures, there have been a long list of closures uh, after uh, the events of 3.11. But the, this, this kind of uh, uh, low scale development has been ongoing for a long time. So if we look in a cumulated level, uh, on a cumulated level, the number of reactors operating had a, uh, an uninterrupted rise on the late, until the late 1980s and then this flat development until 311 uh, with this big uh, drop and then uh, uh, catching up again to a level uh, <clears throat> that has not reached pre-311 uh, levels and remains below numbers that were already reached uh, over 30 years ago. So if we look at uh, the electricity generated by uh, nuclear power, <clears throat> we see this uh, this rise until a maximum of uh, in 2006. We see this drop after 311. And then production has picked up again, uh, reaching almost the same level as the maximum in, in 2006 and 2019. But again, we see uh, uh, in a closer look that uh, China is, is really playing uh, the key uh, um, a role here over the, the past years uh, after uh, 311. If you take uh, uh, China out of the picture, you see that it has remained very flat and there's not much uh, development there. Um, uh, if we look at uh, nuclear construction, we see that uh, uh, we had a huge uh, uh, peak in the late 1970s, and then a drop, uh, you know, until a level which is uh, rather similar to what we had in the very early stages of nuclear development, and then an increase uh, um, until uh, 2013, and we have a stabilized situation now around 50 uh, uh, reactors uh, under construction. It, it is noteworthy, though, that uh, of those 50 reactors under construction, 41 are either in nuclear weapon states or in nuclear weapon uh, state uh, in other countries, but um, uh, realized by companies that are controlled by nuclear weapon states. Uh, this is also a development which, which has been ongoing over the past decade. 
with 63 nuclear reactors that were connected to the grid. 56 of those were either in nuclear weapon states or uh, uh, built in other countries by companies controlled by nuclear weapon states. So, so that's an interesting question. Why is that? And maybe we can come back to that later. We have done an analysis a bit closer to look at what <clears throat> were expected versus real uh, construction durations, because that's the key parameter for determining costs. And uh, we have looked at the uh, 15 startups that took place in the two years, 2018, 2019, uh, nine of those in China uh, uh, and uh, uh, five of those in, in Russia and one in South Korea. And if you compare expected uh, versus realized, construction duration, the, the, the basic lesson is that the trend is towards a doubling in reality of what was actually planned uh, originally. Uh, obviously, uh, there are uh, a number of exceptions. One, one is this very long construction time. On the other hand, there are a few exceptions with, which have uh, <clears throat> very, you know, were close to expected planned uh, construction times. Uh, one uh, point here, there's a lot of talk about small modular reactors, and these are actually two uh, small 30 megawatt uh, Russian reactors. And we see that <clears throat> the promise that was made to build those in very short time, less than four years, could not be kept. And reality was almost four times as long with almost 13 years and obviously with exploding costs that went along. So if we look at another indicator, which is the construction starts of nuclear uh, reactors in the world. And again, we see a very dominant China uh, dominated picture here. Uh, uh, with uh, you know four and five construction starts in in 2020 and four and six in uh, in 2019. So if you take uh, uh, China out, it's it's a very low level of uh, uh, construction that took place. Uh, if you compare this, uh, we had in in an, uh, in 2020 this huge uh, uh, development of renewables that Mika showed uh, earlier, and we have added an, a net 0 0.4 gigawatts. So that is almost 250 gigawatts for renewables versus 0 0.4 per, for nuclear. So really nuclear has become quite irrelevant in that technology market. This is the slide uh, in, a, in a different interpretation that Mika showed. Uh, it's, uh, solar went down 90% in cost since 2009, wind 70%, while nuclear increased 33%. Um, uh, so this is what basically happened over the past uh, 10 years uh, in, in the decade uh, um, after Fukushima began uh, uh, that disaster that is still ongoing. And we see this uh, uh, you know, phenomenal rise of renewables while we have a flat development on nuclear. And it, 2019 was the first year that actually uh, not only installed capacities, but uh, uh, production. Uh, so output was uh, uh, larger by renewables than in the um, uh, nuclear, from the nuclear sector. Um, I'd like to conclude my introduction with that. Uh, let me just attract attention to one point I have not mentioned so far, but I think is very important. And that is the, the influence, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, on the nuclear sector. I think it's vastly underestimated. I think that a lot of work uh, on maintenance and inspection that has not been carried out uh, will have to be carried out in the months and possibly the next couple of years to come to catch up. And that is a dangerous period because we're, we're, we're behind that and that we're also behind inspections by the safety authorities. Thank you very much for your attention. And I hand it back over to Mika. 
マイケルどうもありがとうございました。Thank you very much, Michael.The next speaker.We go on to the next speaker, who is a, a professor emeritus of energy policy, University of Greenwich, Professor Stephen Thomas. We are trying to expand renewable, decarbonize, and we are looking at nuclear. The British policy. Sometimes it was referred to in the Japanese debate to decarbonize with a combination of nuclear. So, Britain、uh, is a leader for us that Japan can learn from. So, he is an expert of British、uh, policy. He will tell us about the British policy and the future. The floor is yours. Thank you.、Um... Michael's presentation showed that if you discount the contribution of China, that nuclear has been in decline from about 1995 onwards. In part, that was down to two specific countries, Germany and Japan, who have, who have uh, for very different reasons,、uh, closed temporarily or permanently their nuclear power plants. But it's also down increasingly to countries with existing capacity who would like to replace their oldest reactors with new ones and like to add new ones to that, and then failing to do that. The UK is a prime example of a country that has continually tried to expand nuclear power and has failed. And we are now on our fourth attempt since 1965 to expand nuclear power, and at most, What we're getting is、uh, one or two new plants built. So, I want to talk about the two most recent failures. Why did they happen? And I want to talk also briefly about the two new policies that are just underway and why those will also fail. Just want to try to share my PowerPoint slides. The first、uh, attempt I want to talk about was the 1979 program、uh, launched by Mrs. Thatcher. of Program of 10 reactors,、uh, one per year from 1981 onwards. And what、uh, destroyed this program finally was the 1990 privatisation of the electricity industry in the UK. The government's priority was to protect and advance nu the nuclear contribution to electricity, but what privatisation did was the opposite, because what it meant was that the costs. Of nuclear had to be proper, accurately identified because if you want to sell things to private investors, you have to identify their costs properly. And the results were shocking. We had three sets of plants at that time. The oldest plants were the original British design, the so called Magnoxes, and they were seen at that time as near the end of their 25 year life. But they would be profitable to run because their costs had long since been written off. What emerged from the privatisation process was that the operating costs alone would double the wholesale electricity price. So the assumption was that they would have to be closed very quickly because they were losing large amounts of money. The successor design, the advanced gas cooled reactor,、um, We had seven of those, and at that time they were so unreliable, their availability was down at around 50%, but they were also heavy loss makers,、uh, and the worst of them were expected to be abandoned after only two or three years of operation, and the best would run for about 25 years, taking them to about、uh, 2000. The one PWR of the Thatcher program that we'd actually started to construct then in 1987, Sizewell, 
was clearly a waste of money. It could never make, be a profitable thing. Uh, and it seemed likely it would be abandoned. So uh, in 1990, it looked likely that nuclear would be phased out by 2000, simply because for the first time, the costs properly been properly identified. The outcome was very different. In fact, the Magnoxes operated for 40 years and the last was only closed six years ago. The AGRs, the Advanced Gas Cool Reactors, are all still operating. Uh, the first will close in 2022 and the last uh, in 2030 after about 40 years of operation. Sizewell B was completed despite its poor economics uh, and a year after it was completed, the only way to privatise it was to give it away. But it will now continue to operate for several more decades. So the target of 10 reactors, one was built and it failed because the costs were too high and demand growth, growth was less than expected. Coming on to the next uh, program, uh, next uh, attempt. In 2006, Tony Blair announced that nuclear power was back with a vengeance. And he'd been convinced by the nuclear rhetoric of the uh, nuclear renaissance. He believed that the nuclear reactors would be so economic that there, were, there was a strong promise there would be no public subsidies. And that promise was only quietly withdrawn about 10 years later. But he claimed that the new designs would compete with gas. And then... Uh, two European pressurised water reactors would cost only £5.6 billion. The latest estimate is about £27 billion, and there's still six years of construction left. So it was a uh, horrendously bad estimate. Three consortia were set up, each comprising large European utilities, and the government expected 16 gigawatts, 11 reactors on five sites, to be built by 2030. The Electricité de France consortium was first away with two sites, Hinkley and Sizewell, each expected to accommodate two EPRs and the first power would be in 2017. In 2013, the deal between the UK government and the EDF consortium was agreed. The cost had gone up to 14 billion and the completion date back to 2023. Two important features to know from this deal. The power is bought on a take or pay basis for 35 years at a fixed price of about 150 US dollars per megawatt hour in 2020 money, more than double the wholesale market price. So the deal was very unpopular with consumers, not because it was nuclear, but because it was so expensive. But because the electricity price was fixed, it meant that EDF has to absorb cost increases. And the latest cost increase means that the expected cost is 70% more in real terms than the 2013 estimate. So that's 70% of extra cost that EDF is going to have to withdraw. So it was a very bad combination of a bad deal for both sides and the Hinkley model won't be re repeated. The reactor vendor Arriva collapsed in 2016 uh, and was taken over by Electricité de France. EDF itself is close to collapse in 2019 because of losses across its whole range of nuclear activities. The uh, other two consortia were sold to Japanese vendors in 2012, 2013, Hitachi and Toshiba, who wanted to use them to build their own designs uh, and would sell on those projects when they were better developed. But no investors were forthcoming and both consortium abandoned. A Chinese consortium was added, uh, led by China General Nuclear in 2016 to build two Chinese designed op uh, reactors. But political opposition in the UK has been growing to that uh, and the project was put on hold in 2021 
and seems unlikely to go ahead. So the target of 18 gigawatts of new capacity by 2030, the maximum likely is three gigawatts. And the Blair program failed because the costs were too high, there were no investors, finance was difficult, and demand growth was less than expected. So let me move on finally to the, uh, uh, the new attempt, the regulated asset base model. EDF is keen to continue with size while selling, building, operating and maintaining the reactor, but not owning it because it doesn't have the money and it's too risky. The two important features of the RAB model are that the reactors would be owned by institutional investors and they would be paid a fixed rate of return on the money they invest. So if, as EDF claims, the reactors cost 20 billion and the rate of return allowed is 6%, they would be paid 1.2 uh, billion per year. RAB will fail because any deal acceptable to consumers will be too risky for investors, and any deal if acceptable in to investors will be too risky to consumers. The newest policy is on small modular reactors, and I will just give you one quote from the former chair of the US Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Advanced nuclear has become the catch-all for the knight in shining armor reactors that promise to address issues that have kept nuclear a marginal electricity player since its inception. But we need more than this open-ended definition. The Biden administration should support projects only if they can compete with renewables and storage on deployment cost and speed, public safety, waste disposal, operational flexibility, and global security. There are none today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Stephen Thomas, inviting our next speaker from Nagasaki University, Professor of Research Center for Nuclear Weapons Abolition, Nagasaki University, Professor Tatsujiro Suzuki. I think I've been working with the professor 20 or 25 years. The, the nuclear fuel cycle, the plutonium civil use, uh, Professor Suzuki has uh, uh, felt uh, uh, some crisis and he has been working on that. When 3.11 occurred at Fukushima, he was the acting chair of the Atomic Energy Commission of Japan, and he worked on expanding disclosure. Suzuki-san, the floor is yours. Thank you for your introduction. Thank you once again for inviting me. It's a precious opportunity for me. Today, as you mentioned, 10 years have passed since the Fukushima accident from the international situation about the Japanese policies on nuclear. First, the Fukushima accident, lessons learned from the accident. As was mentioned already, as an expert in nuclear, and also at that time as a member of the government, on this accident, I felt a strong responsibility. Still, now, the, I'm doing a lot of soul searching because we couldn't prevent the accident from happening and I also would like to say sorry to all the victims. What is the biggest lesson? These three, I always cite these three. First, think unthinkable. This is the basic of security, but that was lacking. Perhaps I can say Japan as a whole, but particularly in nuclear area, we were not able to do this. Can we actually do this now? I am asking this question again. Second, engineers, speaking of risk evaluation, that's probability times the results. That's usually what we use, especially the number of the death. That's one of the big number. This time, number of death or such a stochastic model there are certain risks that we can't evaluate. I felt that very deeply. So going forward, when we are doing this kind of a risk evaluation, the experts from the liberal studies and also from the perspective of persons, including legal, society, ethics, 
ex experts from those and from civil society necessary. Of course, we have to look at the economics as well. Last but not least, public trust is essential. If it, this is lacking, no matter what we do, no matter what policies we introduce, nothing will work. I think these are the lessons from the Fukushima accident. About the global issues, currently, I'm in Nagasaki. Nuclear disarmament is one of my subjects. Japan's dilemma, abolition of nuclear weapons, that's the goal, and there's dependence on nuclear deterrence. We are in this dilemma. On top of that, nuclear fuel cycle. We are dependent on nuclear fuel cycle, or it is described as latent nuclear deterrence. So I'd like to focus on these. At Nagasaki University at Rekuna, Global fissile materials inventory. Each year it is announced A bombs, atomic bombs, or nuclear. In terms of A bomb equivalent, what is the level of inventory currently? This is more than 109,060 bombs equivalent. 1.3 thousand tons. Hiroshima times, so that's 20,000. Plutonium, 530 tons in. 88,000 Nagasaki A bombs. That is the level of plutonium inventory in the world. Each year it's on the increase. Majority of the increase comes from the plutonium. The other is decreasing plutonium of 70% non weapons, non military, and it's on the increase. Out of which the biggest, Japan is the largest owner among the non nuclear weapon states. By 2015, numbers are shown here. As you can see, the red shows in operational warheads plutonium. That's on the decrease. Ye yellow, outside complete warheads. That's in story. Outside complete warheads waiting to be dismantled. Uh, to be dismantled, that's orange. And yellow or outside complete warheads in storage, green, declared excess. Waiting to be disposed of. If you add them up, it's almost constant. But the only one that is consistently on the increase, that's for civilian, so that the plutonium that comes from the nuclear fuel cycle by country, the UK, Russia, Jap UK, Russia, Japan, France, that's the majority. On the Navy top, that's in the past, there has been a phase out of those countries that were doing the reprocessing. China may actually join the map. The UK is the biggest, but they are not actually doing this. So Russia, Japan, France, these are likely producers going forward of plutonium. As you can see, Japan is the only non-weapon state, nuclear non-weapon state. As you know, for faster bridge reactor fuel, to recover them, the, it was to be reprocessed. But as you can see on the left-hand side, the American AEC, in 1974, they came up with estimates. By 2010, global nuclear reactors, 2.5 thousand gigawatts, that's US only, fast FBR, and you can see light water reactors. But this is where we are. You can see that FBR, this is no longer necessary. This is the reality. We have to understand reality. Going to the right reasons. The uranium price stabilized. It is actually decreasing. And reprocessing cost is actually escalating, although it was to be decreased. The FBL is no longer economically. So most of the countries actually discontinued the fuel cycle. And the only three remaining countries there Japan doesn't own nuclear weapons. So what's likely to happen if we try to stick to this? There are a lot of opinions from experts, especially these are the comments from the United States. 2016, during the Obama administration, White House National Security Council expert, John Wolfstyle, this is his comment. So if Japan keeps recycling plutonium, what is to stop other countries from thinking the exact same thing? It would be difficult to stop others. So the impact on other countries, think about that. That's the comment. Next, Thomas Countryman. And at the state, 
department. He was in charge of nuclear non-proliferation. So the continued commitment of Japan to a closed fuel cycle and the Republic of Korea interest in establishing a closed cycle, and China is also interested in this. So if Japan continues to do this, it could lead to nuclear proliferation. Those are the concerns. So these are the three points I wanted to convey. Fukushima accident lessons I, I shared with you. So I believe that Japan's nuclear energy policy needs fundamental assessment, especially from international security standpoints. Plutonium inventory must be reduced and reassessment of nuclear fuel cycle policy is essential. When I was with the AE's Atomic Energy Commission, yes, we did evaluate this review of the cycle, but independent third-party organization is lacking in Japan, so this needs to be established. And also, there should be a decision-making process with public participation, otherwise it's difficult to lead to changes in policies. So these are my recommendations. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Professor Suzuki. As Michael, Stephen discussed, and then listening to Professor Suzuki, we want to continue the discussion on this topic. Last but not least, next inviting uh, Professor Oshima, uh, Faculty of Policy Sciences, Rikoku University. Again, I have been working with him for more than 20 years. Oshima-san, he is the professor teaching at Ryukoku University, and also he is related to the uh, Fukushima analysis of the uh, Nuclear Citizens Council. He is the chair of uh, the Citizens Council. Oshima-san. Yes, uh, I'd like to start. Thank you. Is something not working? I'd like to share my slides. Um, have I managed that? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for allowing me to participate. Thank you very much also for your generous uh, introduction. Uh, with uh, Ms. Obayashi, I uh, have had a long uh, relationship. And so on my part, I'd like to talk about the Fukushima nuclear accident, which was uh, suggested to me. So I'd like to uh, speak on the subject from my own uh, perspective, uh, uh, the 10 years uh, after the nuclear accident, after rather than after the accident, uh, my feeling is that it's still uh, ongoing. Uh, the Fukushima accident for Japan is something that's already happened. Uh, so uh, nuclear accidents is not a risk, it's a uh, damage uh, that has been done. That's how it's perceived. Before the accident, uh, Uh, a lot of intellectuals, uh, including Junzaburo Takagi, has uh, said, uh, talked about what would happen if there's a nuclear accident, what the dangers were. And, and there were always uh, warnings from these intellectuals. At the time, it, it was uh, considered to be a severe accident uh, and uh, a very calamitous uh, effects would uh, occur, and uh, there would be health effects. Uh, uh, the cause of the accident and what might happen, uh, the possibilities uh, were the subject of warning. The Chernobyl accident uh, was uh, the base uh, of these warnings. However, after the accident, Japan, uh, after having uh, experienced the Fukushima accident, something which they uh, did not imagine occurred. Uh, uh, many of these occurred, actually. And broadly speaking, there are two. One is uh, damage to the local residents and the scale of that. Uh, the local uh, residents 
were directly affected and the damage uh, was indeed large. And uh, the uh, contamination inside and outside of the site and the largeness of this. Uh, the local residents suffered indescribable damage. And as to what the damage was, loss of uh, homeland, that is uh, their, I don't know whether you call it motherland or fatherland, uh, their homeland underwent uh, a sea change, and uh, they could not uh, restore it back. Uh, it was an irreversible uh, change that has occurred, and they want uh, their home back. It was uh, deprived uh, from them. Uh, and uh, there are uh, discussions uh, underway that this was uh, indeed a depri deprivation. Temporarily, over 160,000 evacuated, uh, but several uh, uh, tens of thousands are still evacuating. And uh, some have uh, filed the lawsuits, uh, uh, 10,000 or 12,000 or so. When you issue lawsuits, uh, you uh, require a lot of determination. So over 10,000 of uh, lawsuits uh, can uh, make you imagine uh, what the damage, the extent of damage. And then uh, inside and outside the site, uh, there were contaminations uh, inside uh, uh, the site. Among, uh, there was a considerable uh, contamination. The three reactors, how to uh, process that? Uh, recently, the Fukushima uh, accident related uh, uh, nuclear uh, academic society uh, put forth a report, and uh, the re uh, research done has been described there. Uh, the uh, radioactive material uh, that uh, will result out of this is uh, extremely large in the volume. And today, I have, will not give you the numbers. If you decommission one reactor, the radioactive uh, waste resulting from that. There are different kinds. Uh, uh, there are low-level uh, reactive uh, waste. Uh, you have to uh, bury this as several uh, tens of meters. as L1 reactive radioactive uh, waste. Uh, one uh, reactor, if you uh, decommission that, how much uh, radioactive is there? Uh, is there? It's about four, 1,400 times, 50 reactors. Uh, was considerable damage. L1 alone uh, gives rise to that much radioactive uh, waste. So uh, for a prolonged period, uh, it will affect uh, the next generation. There will be a lot of uh, burden and a lot of work uh, which has been imposed on them. And the second is uh, off-site contamination. On off-site contamination is uh, very bad as well. Uh, decontamination uh, uh, allowing people to live in that area and the uh, radioactive level uh, coming down, that was good. But as a result of this, uh, uh, the uh, uh, radioactive waste and the removed uh, soil, uh, that's a legal term, but it's uh, contaminated soil, actually. Uh, the contaminated uh, soil, uh, there's a huge amount of this. What to do about this? This is an unresolved issue, uh, which is outstanding. And that's clear. And this is uh, damage. And you cannot. Uh, attach a monetary value uh, to it. Uh, but if we look at the costs, what amount of cost uh, is it? The government and private sector. Uh, Dr. Tatsujiro Suzuki is involved uh, in uh, the uh, JCER, and uh, they estimate uh, 35 to 81 trillion yen. Uh, that's a government uh, report. Uh, which is uh, tabulated here. For example, uh, for compensation, 7.9 uh, trillion yen. And for recovery, uh, they're uh, creating uh, specific recovery revitalization zones. Uh, and uh, there are recoveries uh, of the victimized areas. We don't know how much that is. And uh, within the site, uh, if uh, accident treatment would be for the uh, reactor itself, uh, uh, the processing uh, of after the incident. Uh, there is no uh, basis for this. Uh, we asked for disclosure of government uh, documents, but uh, we cannot find it. It's uh, 8 trillion yen, uh, we think. And then uh, what I mentioned earlier, uh, radioactive uh, waste, uh, a lot of this uh, which is generated. This is not considered at all. And uh, very roughly, broad brush, uh, per unit cost, uh, if we uh, multiply 
it will, we find that it will exceed the 8 trillion yen. So it's a very broad uh, brush and rough figure. 8 trillion or 10 trillion, we don't know for sure. Uh, but that is the amount which will be occur incurred. And then decontamination. Uh, up until now, uh, it was said that it will cost 4.2 trillion yen. And as for dis uh, disposal of contaminated waste and removed uh, soil, uh, 1.6 trillion for interim uh, storage facilities. And final disposal it has not yet been considered. And as to who is paying, uh, that's very important in terms of cost. How much uh, per kilowatt? Uh, rather than that, of course, that's an important uh, item. But who is going to pay for that? Uh, most of that uh, will be uh, borne by the public. For example, compensation will be such that uh, most uh, would be public burden through electricity rates. And then uh, the recovery part is a uh, part of that uh, would be uh, from the uh, National Treasury. And if you look at all of this, you'll understand uh, that uh, most of this uh, is uh, a burden of uh, the public for Japan. Uh, nuclear power generation, it's not a matter of whether it's cheap or expensive. It's really cheap. You have to think about uh, the uh, payment of this kind. Otherwise, uh, you do not come up uh, with uh, uh, an accurate uh, calculation of the cost of nuclear power generation. Uh, in the interest of time, I'd like to move on. Going forward, for Japan, uh, nuclear power generation is not a risk. It's something that's already happened. And it's a cost that has been incurred. And uh, we have to think about what to do about this uh, nuclear power generation. As uh, Obaya-san has mentioned, uh, uh, we have to phase it out uh, during our generation, and at least uh, we uh, should uh, not uh, pass it on to the future generations. And we have this negative uh, legacy, a huge negative legacy, and uh, this is uh, perhaps fate. Uh, we have to pass this on to the next generation. Uh, at least uh, the way uh, the democratic uh, decision making, a proper democratic decision making, uh, should uh, be done. Uh, and that is, uh, I think, the lesson from the Fukushima accident. I'm sorry uh, I have uh, 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 gone so fast during the short period allocated to me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Oshima. We have some 18 minutes or so. By way of asking questions, uh, let us engage in our uh, Q&A. Do not be too long with your response, please. First of all, may I ask Michael Schneider, uh, everybody, can you switch on your camera? We would like to see your face. Michael Schneider and uh, Professor Suzuki, questions to you. In the case of China, in terms of renewable energy, China is the driving force because half of uh, the global renewable is done by China. China's role is large. In the case of nuclear, while the activity was flat, China is leading the nuclear development. So the role of China in the global nuclear industry, the big role of China was mentioned. Professor Suzuki mentioned about whether it's civilian or military purpose, at least China plans to start a reprocessing of the nuclear fuel. So I want to ask Michael Schneider and Professor Suzuki for additional comments. And Michael, you want to share another slide? Very much, uh, <clears throat> Mika. Before I show that that quote from CGN, which is very interesting, uh, just to sum up what the situation is, China is basically building at home uh, and has been focusing on that for for a long time. But if if one puts that into perspective, in 2020, uh, China started up two gigawatts of nuclear at home and 150 gigawatts combined solar and wind. So it's two versus 150. So that that, that one has to keep in mind uh, always that, that there is, yeah, I mean, the renewables investment is just dramatically uh, larger than, than the nuclear investments even at home. Then outside the country, there is only one country where, where China has built uh, uh, nuclear power plants, and that's Pakistan. And it's it's it's, it's sort of like running the the Pakistani uh, 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 nuclear program. It's almost like building at home. It's a little bit like like EDF building in the UK. The only other <clears throat> uh, concrete investment right now is Hinkley Point C, 
where <clears throat> China holds uh, uh, 30 percent of the the investment. Um, but otherwise, uh, China has tried several times, and it very much looks as if China has given up. And I, I show you a, a slide from a, a, a very surprising addendum to their uh, annual <clears throat> report, uh, 2019. Um, it, it basically says that uh, CGN, which is the only uh, um, Chinese nuclear company that is uh, on a stock market in Hong Kong, by the way, it, 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 it lost 30% of its stock market value in one week. We don't really know what happened over the past week. But they clearly say that they have no further targets right now for overseas market exploration. And so, and they have allocated uh, the the money that they had uh, reserved for, uh, uh, you know, exploring other markets. Uh, have allocated the money to Chinese projects. So it it seems like a reorientation, strategic reorientation of uh, China in this in uh, when it comes to international markets. Hi, I know. About China's nuclear fuel cycle, just like Japan, China doesn't have so much uranium, not so much uranium. The fast breeder reactor FBR and nuclear fuel cycle, they should be closed. That's the public policy. The Joyo type of experimental reactor is being operated. According to the plan, large scale breed processing plant. They are planning to buy two units from France. They are reportedly in negotiation. So I don't really think there is a conclusion. Well, Michael, you might know better than I do. But just to suppose that they should buy, non-conclusion, all right. So if they should buy this from France, just like Rocasho, they would have something comparable to Rocasho plant too. Yes, they are nuclear weapon state, but they're going to have more plutonium. It's not for military use in principle. Yes, they will be open to safeguards, but plutonium inventory will increase. So we are very concerned about it. But fortunately, regarding the plan, Michael, just like you talked about the delay in the construction duration, construction, there's been so much delay, so it could be revisited. I think there's such a possibility. Thank you very much. The expansion of renewable, uh, the Chinese people, uh, they refer to expansion of renewable, and uh, the investment in the nuclear is much smaller compared to what they are doing in Renewable. Mr. Stephen Thomas, Professor Stephen Thomas, if I may ask you, you have told us about the history of nuclear development in the UK. Why, despite all the failures, Britain has such a strong position to continue nuclear? What is the reason that they stick to? I think this is the most difficult, but also one of the most important questions to try and answer, because while countries like Britain keep wanting to give nuclear another chance. And there are there's, there's, there are lots of countries like that. It, Britain is perhaps one of the worst. But if we can't understand why they are wanting to give nuclear another chance, then we will never phase out nuclear power. I mean, there's, there are some conspiratorial theories, like it's about uh, the military connection, and in Britain's case, the need to retain a submarine nuclear submarine industry, there's lobbying by powerful industrial in interests, and there's the fact that politicians like big projects. They would prefer to launch a nuclear power program than to insulate a, a million low-income households. And I think those are important, but I don't think they um, don't think they explain everything. And I think you need to look much more into psychological factors. Uh, and the belief in science and technology, belief that science will solve problems like waste disposal, that science, if we keep trying, will make advanced reactors work properly. 
uh, and with technology that, that the usual things that happen with technology, the more you do something, you, the better you get at it. The more you build them, the cheaper they get. Uh, and technology change will improve things. These have never happened for nuclear power over 60 years, yet politicians still have cling to that belief that they will happen. This time, it will work. And it, it's, I, I have almost despaired of, of persuading poli uh, politicians to think of that. Going back to 1990, I thought that was the end for nuclear power in Britain. Yet it kept coming back and it keeps coming back. And I don't see a way to, to stop it. And that's a very depressing thought for me. Couple of points. May I? Um, I would add to uh, Steve's list of hypotheses. Uh, the UK government didn't have a plan B. And that's always very bad if you don't have a plan B for nuclear in, in, instead of the nuclear uh, program. And the second is that is mere incompetence. I mean, the, the incompetence that has been on display by decision makers in this area is striking. Uh, which is, by the way, not only uh, a valid point, I think, for the UK, but also for countries like France. I mean, if you look at how these decisions were made and how these projects were actually carried out, the ones that are underway, it's it's a, a, an amazing collection of, uh, you know, areas of incompetence. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for that straightforward observation. In the case of UK, Britain, also they do have a massive deployment of offshore uh, wind. So I, actually, I think they are struggling to find a plan B right now. As we run out of time, Suzuki-san, Oshima-san, my question goes to you. Professor Suzuki, you mentioned about the fuel cycle, and you mentioned that uh, that is the starting point that has to be changed that has to be given up. In Japan, the role of fuel cycle, I think that the fuel cycle does have a role to play in order to continue nuclear, but that is not sufficiently discussed. On the other hand, to stop nuclear power generation, uh, the spent fuel, high-level waste have to be dealt with. Without the destination of the waste, nuclear cannot be stopped. Uh, we are in a very uh, funny uh, circular situation, going nowhere. I ask you for the comment. And Professor Oshima, my question to you. At the moment, uh, we have looked at the Fukushima and its uh, continuing impact. And indeed, we get so depressed. So uh, you look depressed is the, the chat messages that I'm receiving, but it's no laughing matter. Uh, Professor Oshima, you are economist, and the nuclear expense is what you have been studying. From that perspective, if you can tell us about your latest observation about the expense and the cost about the nuclear versus the renewable, two questions to you. Right. Phasing out nuclear, in order to do so, regarding such policies to phase out nuclear. If you look at the current policies, right after oil crisis, to expand the nuclear grant, it's allocated nuclear cycle and research institute focused on nuclear, nothing has changed. They have remained the same to lower the dependency on nuclear, even if we cannot actually phase out. But currently, in the discussion, it does say, it does say, lower the dependency on nuclear. If that's the case, right after 1973, 94, until 1977, until that time, nuclear expansionary systems and institutions, they have to be reviewed, including the nuclear fuel cycle. I think that that must be done first, because there's so much support for nuclear. Next, about the nuclear waste. As Dr. Okushiba mentioned about the Fukushima-related various problems, 
be it nuclear promotion or stopping nuclear power generation, it's something that we are confronted with. As Professor Oshima said, it has happened. Whether you are against it or you are for it, unless you resolve this, nothing can be done. But nuclear waste, those people who are promoting them, they are saying this nuclear waste for the promotion. And those people who are posted, they are saying they are doing this because they are posted. Irrespective of your positions, a nuclear waste problem must be resolved. So the policy must be positioned in that way. Otherwise, it will be really difficult to reach consensus. And it holds true for compensation, irrespective of position, positions, supra-partisan negotiations and address is necessary. Thank you very much. I'd like to supplement uh, regarding uh, cost. And so I was told to do that, uh, supplementary marks on co cost. Uh, REI quite recently uh, created uh, this uh, column. Uh, the existing uh, plants, uh, when you restart them, it's cheap. So uh, we, I calculated. And so what I found was that uh, additional safety countermeasures cost is large. And furthermore, and uh, the uh, time for closing is long. And so the construction cost and the com a cost of uh, decommissioning, if we exclude that, after 2011, if we uh, consider the expenses after 2011, this is uh, the amount uh, that uh, we find. It's an extremely high cost. And nuclear, uh, the Fukushima, uh, uh, according to government calculations, is uh, 10 yen in cents. Uh, maybe I should say in cents. For example, 10 yen. They said it was 10 yen. For 40 years, if we operate, most uh, uh, of uh, all of them are quite become uh, very expensive. And if we operate 60 years, uh, OE4, uh, four, Yongo4, four, uh, would be the only one. Uh, if we, uh, the, the more we delay restart, it becomes more expensive. And if countermeasures are increased, uh, the expensive, uh, expense uh, grows. Uh, so restarting, a reoperation. The d decision uh, to reoperate uh, uh, was a bad management decision. It was a failure in terms of management. As to why we restart, uh, that is uh, because uh, the payment has already been uh, made, uh, so they want to recover some part of it. That's uh, what's behind their uh, attempts to restart. Uh, it's not because of economical reasons. They've already paid, and they want to recover some uh, of it. Uh, so putting the cart before the horse is what's happening. And I believe that uh, elect power utilities uh, feel that they have failed. Uh, so uh, I feel that I want to liberate them uh, from uh, their suffering. Uh, there, uh, there's a lot of diseconomy in this, and so in the ultimate end, uh, it will be a, mean a loss uh, for them, and uh, they'll uh, be facing a lot of risk. So I believe this is a serious issue. For details, uh, if you look at uh, the English version, it's been translated into English, so please refer to the English version of this. Thank you. Thank you very much. I wanted to invite all of you for your concluding remarks, but it seems that I have run out of time. Professor Oshimo mentioned about Jinzaburo Takagi, my boss. In the 1990s, I was working with the CNIC with Takagi. That is where I learned about nuclear, so renewable climate changes. That is why I started to work on this topic. Uh, what uh, Dr. Tagaki told me was uh, that I am a person of the 20th century. I am from the old century, starting from plutonium development and nuclear. Uh, Takagi said he was an expert of nuclear, but renewable climate, new power system, those are the matters of 21st century. Takagi was saying so. Uh, but Professor Oshima mentioned that uh, the Fukushima accident occurred. And to the next generation, we are about to leave a legacy, a negative legacy that lasts so long. I am very depressed and oppressed. If possible, I want to stop complete commercial nuclear within my generation. Personally, what Takagi did before his death was what to do about nuclear waste. So 
I want everybody to participate in the discussion so that we can transfer a positive legacy to a future posterity. And the next will be scenario so 2050, technology pathway for 2050, and technology to realize that it is going to be a forward-looking discussion. As we mentioned at the beginning, we want to talk about the future going forward. I thank you very much for your kind attention to session two. And then I hand over the microphone to Yuko Nishida, chair of session three. Thank you I very much for having me.